on our president, uh, Dr. James Edits, who will do the introductions and welcome everybody to the platform. And thereafter, I will take it and lead us into the technical session. Dr. Edit, uh, the show is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Tumbosu. Um, on behalf of the Executive Committee of NAPE, the Advisory Council, and the Board of Trustees, in fact, the entire membership of NAPE, let me welcome everybody who is here on this call. And I'm sure that uh, we are going to have very insightful talk on this very um, interesting topic. Let me say that we welcome not only uh, the entire membership, but also those who are joining us from uh, other works of life. You know, NAPE is uh, uh, a global association and we take memberships from every work of life. And uh, you'll be surprised we have associate members who are financiers, who are uh, business people in other areas. We also have uh, a few lawyers and people in the banking sector. And that is what we encourage. And let me also say that we have been one of the foremost associations um, that interface with government in ad uh, advocacial uh, uh, capacities. And today we are having a, a huge section of our members coming for this uh, technical uh, meeting. Um, while we do that, let me say that we should also think about the fact that um, we have uh, the elections coming up soon and we are also uh, asking for our members to volunteer, you know, because this is a situation where um, we don't necessarily uh, do this for our own benefit, but the benefits do rub off on us and we would like to have a lot of our members uh, volunteer to positions uh, where they can serve the association. This is my key message today. And I would love for us to think about it and put ourselves out there to serve our association. Uh, thank you very much to Mosum. And on that note, uh, let me first of all um, say that this is a small brief and I welcome everybody to this talk and let's enjoy it and have a fruitful deliberation. Thank you very much. You're all welcome. Indeed. Um, thank you very much, P. So just to run along uh, this. So today we have a technical uh, presentation on digital well operations in the oil and gas sector, a case for real-time well engineering. And this session is sponsored by Ali Bolton. But before we get into that, I would like us to have a connect. Uh, I will bring the president-elect up as well when I finish running through the agenda, and then we will start our meeting. Just so you know, as typical, because it has now become typical now, we always do the poll and the survey during the meeting. And this, like I said earlier uh, in previous meeting, is to really help us to gauge the appetite of our members, what you want, the kind of topic that is important and useful to you at the various phases of careers that you may be. Our safety moment today is going to be different. The president is going to be reading us a speech about our need to volunteer uh, because that's, that's, that's important now. You know, We need to start thinking about our association differently. So that's our safety moment. It's a reflection moment for today. 
and we'll get to that. So before you run off after the pre presentation, the president would, like I said, talk us through the election and his thoughts and what he will prefer for us to start thinking about. We already talked about the geoscience education program. Please, if you missed the, the inaugural session, we encourage you that you join us. I will share details of the, of the next one soon. The president elects when he gives his opening, we'll talk about the conference planning and I'll bring back the president to share through this profile. This is what our agenda looks like today. We have 30 minutes, 30 concise minutes for our presentation. And then we have 20 minutes to ask our question and our presenter and our technical chairperson are here to moderate that particular arm of the session. So I'd like to, at this point, bring the president elect to open up the, the meeting. Uh, welcome the technical chairperson, and then I'll read his profile, then we go into this conversation. P, please over to you. Yeah, hi, Tumos. Uh, thanks so much uh, for the introduction, and also thanks to President um, Dr. Edith F. Nape for his opening remarks. I just want to thank everybody for uh, finding time to attend this um, rather interesting um, looking um, um, presentation today um, from Halliburton. Um, I'm, I'm really excited about, about this um, and about the speaker, uh, as, as you will learn from um, the chairperson, um, Mr. Bashi Kodedoye F. Nape. And um, just want us to sit down and enjoy this. And um, well, I don't know, um, uh, P.S., uh, do you want us to go into the conference now? We want to wait until after the, I think we should wait until after the session before we talk about the conference. Mm, they are going to run off. <laughs> so please do it now. People are going to run off. I mean, people, there's so much conflict for everyone's time. So I prefer that we do all of that prior to the technical meeting. And after the technical meeting, we can take it again for those who have the time to stay behind. Okay, that's fine. Um, again, we are, we are aware that our uh, conference, our November conference is um, 13 to, to 17 November uh, this year. And um, it's, it's, uh, it's our 40th, 40th conference anniversary. And we expect to have a fun field and um, a, a packed um, event. There's a lot happening be uh, between um, now and then we started with the conference planning. I keep on, just like President said, also asking that people volunteer to serve in the various committees. The committees are working assiduously to ensure a successful conference. Um, and uh, we're expecting that um, also papers are being sought for, uh, the call for abstracts. The first call for abstract is out. Uh, we see that the theme of the conference this year is on global energy transition <clears throat> and the future of the oil and gas industry, evolving regulations, emerging concepts and opportunities. And we have a number of uh, very equally interesting sub themes. So also uh, asking that people go back and check through all the great work they have done in the, in the, uh, the industry and academia and showcase the, the, that good work um, during this um, forthcoming conference. Um, we also <coughs> are asking for uh, the for exhibitions. Um, exhibition spaces are already out, and uh, we're also as for companies, uh, we've not had uh, too much of that in the last two years due to the uh, COVID um, pandemic. But uh, this year is a physical conference, so we expect that that uh, companies will also want to showcase what's been happening in the last um, two to five years and um, what what their plans are uh, going forward. Um, a lot of a lot will be happening um, um, during the conference this year. The plan also is for us to have our pre-conference workshop uh, in October, which is which is for those who are uh, old in the system. It's a reflection. It's a go back to where we used to have the month the conference. So um, we expect that um, once the uh, different committees have, have completed their work, uh, we will um, share more more insights into that. So I'll just, I'll just leave it at that and, and um, still the, um, leave people with, um, with a plea to um, call to service. Let's um, find time to, um, 
to work with and for our association. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, P. Uh, so I'm going to take the president back to do his reflection moments now. Like I said earlier, the president is in place of our safety. He's doing, giving us some reflection. So P, please, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tumbosu. Um, I think this is very important. Uh, so let me start by saying uh, to all our dear NAPE members, it is time for us to have a serious talk. So let's get to it. But before we get started, like any other business, I'd like to say a big thank you to each one of you for your commitment to NAPE and to the growth of our organization. A lot can be said about your contributions, your volunteerism and your active participation, especially within the conference planning committee and all the other activities and, com and committees that we put together. However, there has been a recurrent issue with our elective positions. Uh, in some instances, what you will find out is that when elections are called, more than half of the time, there are no nominations for some positions. This is becoming a recurrent occurrence that we need to address as an association. I recognize that we are all very busy professionals working in a very busy and strategic industry and contributing as much as we can and even beyond to the social economic development of this nation. But like everything else, if the place of technocrat advocacy is lost, then there'll be no organization or association that will be able to run by itself. It is on this note that I would like to kindly plead with each one of us to take the NAPE elections a bit more seriously. The electoral committee this year has gone through the pains of making sure that there is a level playing ground for anyone who nominates himself or herself or whoever they think is worthy of any of the available positions. So I am hereby pleading again with the extension of three days that we have left that you please within your organizations convince your leadership Convince yourself and make yourself available to volunteer to this great association. NAPE was made by people like ourselves who were in the industry. It will be a shame to enjoy the benefits of the visionary and not have somebody or people who will be able to carry the torch for the future generations. Think about a NAPE where we do not have anyone contesting for an election. Think about a NAPE, where there is no president. Think about a NAPE, where there is no executive committee. That is the situation in which we find ourselves if we do not begin to address these recurrent issues about the lack of our willingness and commitment to volunteer actively at the executive level of NAPE. I will close with this. Like I mentioned earlier, I recognize that our organizations are very busy places, but there is a place and strategic advantage for being a NAPE member. It exposes you to happenings beyond the four walls of your own organization. It creates for you strategic connections, strategic network, as well as access to resources, access to industry expertise, knowledge sharing, knowledge showcasing beyond your organization. Yes, your organization may be enough, but for your career advancement, you definitely need a NAPE to support your growth beyond your organization. 
So I would like to also ask that you extend this message to the top management in your organization about supporting NAPE and not from a punitive perspective of your doing association activities, but instead positioning our support for NAPE as a contribution to the, advances, uh, the advancement of geosciences and upstream activities in Nigeria and even beyond. This is my plea. This is my serious talk for today. NAPE members, please let's arrest this situation together. Without you, there is no NAPE. So my expectation is that with the election extension now granted till May the 23rd, 2022, which happens to be on Monday and is three working days from now, I would like that we have a healthy competition across our available positions. And the beautiful thing about this year is that the competition, the campaigning, and the distracting method that our elections have naturally evolved to become, uh, has been fully eliminated. This comes at no cost to you. NAPE will be creating all campaign materials for all nominated personnel. NAPE will be doing the campaign for everyone from a central electoral body. You do not need to do anything other than to how up and be ready to serve. I look forward to getting more nominations from you, from your colleagues and from the industry. Thank you, NAPE members. And we look forward to having you all contest and volunteer for our association. Thank you and God bless you all. Thank you. Tumbosu, over to you. Thank you, P. Uh, and I do hope that we would be receiving your nominations after this. Like the president said, there are a couple of guidelines. Please assess them on the NAPI website. If you have questions, you can wait till the end of this meeting. We'll have a short Q&A session to address that. Assess the constitution, assess the electoral guidelines and the new update around campaigning as well to help you position and determine which of the election or elective position you would like to nominate yourself for. Thank you, thank you, P. Um, I'll take it over from here. Uh, let me just remove your spotlight and then we'll go into our presentation for today. I'll share my screen quickly. Okay. Okay. This is dragging a bit. Give me a minute, please. Okay. All right. So I'm going to be bringing up our technical chairperson for today. You have been seeing his face on the screen and I'm sure that a lot of us are familiar with Mr. Bashir already, uh, being one of our distinguished fellows at NAPE. Tune, can you confirm that you can see my screen? Because I can't even see my screen. Can anyone confirm that? Yes, I can see your screen. Yes, okay, I can see your screen. All right. Thank you. All right, so I, I, I would like to introduce Mr. Bashir Okoladoi. Uh, he's our technical chairperson for today. What we do with our technical chairperson is to ensure that we bring subject matter expertise to um, direct our conversation during our meeting. And today we have Mr. Koledoye, uh, FNAPE. He is a geoscientist and is an entrepreneur uh, running several companies. Um, he obtained his BSc Geology from the University of Ibadan and followed by an MSc in Mineral Exploration from University of Ibadan as well. And in 1999, he obtained his MSc from Stanford, focusing on geological and environmental sciences. He has 32 years postgraduate experience, including an experience with Chevron, Nigeria and overseas while he worked there. Um, 
fast forward to when he started his business and now uh, he has he is the founder and managing director of Damatan Nigeria. He's held this position since 2008. Afterwards, he set up Damatan Gas and Power Products Limited for the marketing of LPG and development of LPG facilities. Uh, this operation is currently all over Nigeria at different marketing sector. He also co-founded the first uh, a company called First Modular Gas Systems Limited, which is a midstream company focused on the processing of natural gas and the marketing of products, including CNG, LPG, and the condensates. Like I, I mentioned when I started, we are familiar with Damatan, we are familiar with Mr. Koledoe. So he's like a mentor to most of us. He's mentored several, he, he himself wrote 100, but I know that he's done much more than that. Uh, he's mentored, he's sponsored, he's an advocate of NAPE. If there is an advocate position in NAPE, we should be giving Damatan and Mr. Kolodoe. Um, he's a fellow of NAPE, he's COMEG registered, and he's also a member of some of that geosciences organization. I'd like to mention here that he's a visiting lecturer at the Obafemi Aulo University and the Pan-African University as well. So thank you, Mr. Bashir, for honoring our inv invitation to chair this session for us. I would hand over to you to take us through the sec technical aspect of this meeting. Thank you, Tuboson. Thank you for that introduction. Um, it's actually my honor to be invited to chair this um, technical session. And uh, without further ado, I will start by uh, introducing our topic and uh, our speaker. Uh, our speaker for today is Mr. Chukwemeka Achilike. Um, he's the technical lead for drilling and completions in Halliburton. Um, he's a drilling engineer with about 15 years experience across measurement and logging while drilling tools, uh, providing maintenance and support for the tools, uh, working on drilling design, uh, operation support, um, using artificial intelligence and machine learning for real-time monitoring of operations. Um, Mr. Achilike owns, holds an MS in drilling and well engineering from the Robert Gordon University. Uh, in, in the UK. So the topic today, as was mentioned earlier, is digital well operations in the oil and gas sector, uh, a case for real-time well engineering. Um, well engineering, real-time well engineering helps to provide automatic detection of rich state and seamless coupling of engineering and system uncertainty models to associated drilling data. The application of this real-time well engineering helps to provide accurate engineering calculations to compute drilling parameters using automatically updated models to facilitate effective operational decisions that aid a successful drilling execution. It uses advanced modeling techniques, deep data computational physics and algorithms to assist in reducing the time an effort to perform um, advanced drilling analytics and uncertainty. These analytics help detect anomalies or deviations, enabling fast real-time decisions and adjustments to stay on plan and help minimize the number of drilling days and costs. Uh, the RTW efficiently and effectively diagnoses and predicts the smartest drilling outcome with advanced technology tools to help tune rig operations and mitigate operational risks. Um, it's uh, an easily configurable cloud-based real-time tool for monitoring real-time and supporting geosteering. Um, so uh, that's the abstract for the presentation. And um, I want to say that um, there is a lot of drilling and engineering in this, in this topic which um, is interesting to us as earth scientists that operate um, you know, exploration and development um, assets uh, working in integrated groups with um, engineers. Uh, so we hope to be able to um, understand better how this new tool uh, could be useful um, as we work in those teams. 
Um, generally, what should we expect from this presentation? Um, we should, I think the, the major thing that we should expect uh, at the end of this presentation is um, a focus on uh, the fact that there are several things in our drilling operations that can be automated. And what this automation does for us is to allow us to predict uh, problems that we could encounter while drilling. Um, and not just that, to also be able to solve those problems either ahead of um, where, where we get, where expect to see the problems or to actually solve them while we're drilling. Um, and essentially, this will change uh, the way we do things in the industry. Um, that's what we should expect to get from this. And um, once the presentation is done, we'll have the opportunity to ask Mr. Chiluke questions. So um, Chukemeka, you have the floor now. Thank you very much, uh, Ogabashu. Um, good to be here and good to be speaking to the NAPE team. I'll be sharing my screen presently. Um, yeah, please let me know when you see my screen and we can start. I see your screen now. Yes, we do. All right, perfect. So I will, I'll start by um, reminding everyone, like Tubal um, mentioned, and uh, Mr. Bashir has also mentioned, um, more inclined to drilling than to geoscience. Yes, we'll talk about some geoscience here, uh, but I'm not a geoscientist, I see, but I am an explorationist because if you drill and you drill in areas where you don't have um, a lot of information, you're exploring and getting more information. So yeah, we we'll work collaboratively with the subsurface team, geoscientists, uh, to get this process done and to, to make things efficient, all aimed obviously at um, Improving uh, at the end of the day, the barrels of oil that are recovered, reducing costs while doing it because it's a business, right? So we want this business to be done efficiently and we'll make money. So that's it. So we're going to dwell on digitalizing well operations. So I'm going to try to not use too much buzzwords or catchy words um, just so that the understanding is there. Okay. So it's wanting to digitalize um, well, operations in general is another thing to, um, is wanting to digitalize drilling in general. The engineering and the design is another thing to digitalize, a, little, a, a lot more tricky to digitalize operations, right? So Halliburton has what we'll call the well construction 4.0 that digitalizes different sections of well construction or if you like, well execution, okay? So half the digital well program which is a tool that enhances collaboration between the, the subsurface team and the well engineering team. So it can connect and pull last trajectories from the, the static models, right? Into the drilling engineering applications, not one, the whole lot, right? And automatically do what we'll call um, business of design. And then at the end, just a little bit of adjustments, you have a drilling program. Most people know that it takes a whole lot of time, but it's digitalized, it's simple, it follows any company's business uh, process management, all of that is encoded in this uh, digital process. Then we also have the digital world operations, which is the area we're going to dwell today, which is looking at digitalizing well operations or well execution. Yeah, I can use that interchangeably. And finally, you have digital world automation. What does that do? That, that ensures that whatever design or engineering you've done, be able to use relatively modern rigs to ensure that whatever parameters you've designed for, you stay within those parameters. Yeah, every once in a while you see some surprises. When you see those surprises, this well automation is able to link back to the design and adjust the design accordingly. So you learn, so it forms like a digital twin. So you learn and then it feeds it straight back to, to operations, right? So you have that closed loop. Okay, so essentially we'll have a full solution, right? That is cloud-based. So what does being cloud-based mean? It means I don't have to do any installations on my machine. I only need the internet and a laptop and I'm good to go. 
So this is deployed on a cloud, making it easy to utilize. You don't, there's no heavy lifting, so you don't need to use high-end machines because the heavy lifting is done in the cloud. So you're sort of visualizing your work being performed in the cloud. So specifically, the real-time engineering essentially automatically detects which state. By that, I mean what's happening at the rig at a particular point in time. I don't have to look at readout from sensors to do that. The, it has an AI embedded in it that will just say, okay, if these and these are happening on the rig side, that means this is currently the rig state. So it's able to do this and also able to get, obtain this data from the sensors and then change that to actionable intelligence, right? As some people will say in, in, in management, actionable intelligence, and then you can make decisions, okay? So to simplify this comment, I'm going to say the real-time model engineering essentially compared to the traditional real-time technologies is able to, instead of just visualizing data from the sensors on the rig and just you're putting that up on the screen, that is just raw data. What this does is then takes that data, apply artificial intelligence and machine learning to that data, at the same time, employing well engineering calculations and physics-based solutions so that what you are now visualizing is not raw data, but contextual information. What does it, while at the same time, obviously comparing what you plan for with what you see, what's the result of this? But the result is if a problem is coming, it will usually show a print, fingerprint or a trend. I can see problems before they occur. And if I can see problems before they occur, I can then take actions and mitigate the problem and essentially make sure that I don't get most of the common problems that we see. It doesn't solve everything, nothing does, but most of the common problems that I experience doing. Um, drilling, the world drilling, able to remove that. So saving me time and money, efficiency. So at the end of the day, business-wise, I cut my costs and I prove my gain, All right? So how is this set up? So this is set up essentially to get data that is acquired by sensors on the rig and then transmit that data to the cloud. And then we can apply these algorithms on, on, on the data and then you see results. So you can get this data, uh, you acquire data from sensors, right? But that data is put together because for this to work efficiently, you have to take data coming from the um, subsurface, which will be your um, MWD or LWD, measurement while drilling or logging while drilling, particularly measure logging while drilling, right? That, that's the, the, the aspect that most of uh, the folks on this call will like, but it also takes a lot of uh, data from the measurement while drilling, that's the survey information. Right, and then it takes that to the surface. It also takes surface data from the mod logging unit, right, and brings the data together, what we we'll call data aggregation, and then transmits this data from the rig. Uh, this particular solution, because the improvement on regular technology is this particular technology is able to collect the data irrespective of who the vendor on the rig is. So doesn't we don't do, this is my thing, or this technology doesn't look at, this is done from this company, so we're, we're finding it difficult to integrate. No, it's an open platform. Whoever is there, so long as they have their uh, data in the standards for real time, which is called WITS ML, WITS or WITS ML, then we're able to take that data and send it to the, the um, real time system on the cloud, and then able to utilize that data usefully, right? So in order to utilize that data, we would usually um, visualize as a decision space platform. So this is where we'll see the data raw, if, if that, so that this sort of validates the engineering we are running. This is also the place that if you want to do geostaring, you can take a line from here through an application we'll call OpenWire, a solution we'll call OpenWire, and pull that into your, um, um, decision space geoscience, so into your geoscience environment, and then you can then use that to do your proper geoscience. While the other stream gets to the real-time on engineering platform where you now then optimize operation as well as uh, prevent problems because you see them beforehand, mitigate them, and then you don't have the problems going forward. So talking real quick about the decision space, uh, real-time 365, also tend to call it. So this is what your current traditional um, real-time technology platform will look like. However, this specific one is great in the sense that it doesn't just allow you to visualize on uh, 
on a, on a computer. It allows you to visualize on your mobile phone. Um, obviously, you have, because it's a cloud, so you only need internet. Open a browser and you can visualize. It is vendor neutral, like I said, open application can connect to anybody. And whatever data you want to visualize from the field, you can visualize on this platform, be it from the cementing, from the wireland folks, uh, from the uh, MWD, uh, DD folks, you can visualize all of that. And what's even more brilliant, it has a template of visualization dashboard that you can adjust however you seem fit. So you see the information you want to see, however you want to see it in groups or whatever, right? And then how do we use this for geostaring? Now, when this information that goes to the decision space through uh, decision space real time 365, when that information gets there, you're able to get logs there. So that logs goes through open wire to a uh, subsurface environment or geoscience environment. Okay. Now, the specific application we use in the geoscience environment is called the horizontal wall correlation. So essentially, what you do is we have predicted information, right? Uh, uh, structural model, uh, static model, we already have the predicted ones. So now that you're drilling, you're getting real-time logs that's updating this real-time. So the correlation you had previously is predicted, but this is actual, this is what things are. This is what's happening at this time, okay? So because this is the tool is currently in whole and you're visualizing what is where, you can actually see things that the, the generally expanded uh, uh, interpretation you did before would not show. Things like micro faults, uh, uh, storms of shale you're trying to avoid. So you essentially want to maximize sweep efficiency by placing the well exactly where you need the well to do that to be, right? So as these logs are coming in, we have what we call dynamic frameworks to fill that like it says, it's dynamic, right? So it automatically updates your tops, the contacts, yeah, all of this information. So you're able to use this to guide the guy on the rig that's drilling because survey is coming in. And survey, for those who, who don't know while I'm drilling, is where the well is at a particular point in time. So I can now tell the driller, you know what? Yeah, there's something here. Do you want to go up or down, left or right, or in this direction to avoid that area? Yeah, yeah, go in this area. This is exactly where I want things to be. So you can imagine how efficient this well will be once it's done. This is obviously looking at horizontal wells, right? So if I'm going to take this, the picture at the left, so what you have here, this is my the, the top of this interval. This is the bottom of the, of the reservoir. And I have a pilot hole already drilled, right? With the interpretation and the well. Then before I start drilling, I obviously already have my prognosed uh, interpretation as well as my prognosed well. So while the real time information is coming in, yeah, I can have a control point here as soon as I get the, the, the top. Is it deeper than I thought? Is it, um, do, I, do I meet the top you know, quicker than or shallower than I thought? So there's that information here. But at the same time, as you can notice, this is where the initial interpretation is, but you can see that the current actual interpretation is deviating from the initial. So this current interpretation now helps me place the well actually where it should be rather than where previous interpretation suggested that it should be, right? Now we're going to come, and from now on, we're going to focus on the well engineering, right? So what does the real-time well engineering do? What are some of its modules and the benefit of those modules? So we'll have what we'll call the 3D intelligence. So the 3D intelligence is able to provide a three-dimensional visualization of your well, as well as all your um, um, operational parameters instant at any point in time instantly right so beyond just visualizing this i mean when i say visualize i mean three-dimensional with any um intervals you've already or lithology you've imputed into the system uh, with the bottom hole assembly that's in the, in the well the casings whatever they are it's able to provide pictorial information of what's going on instantaneously at any point in time but far more importantly it's able to also show you an operations window within which all the parameters you're utilizing are optimized. Anything outside that window, you have some sort of concern or the other. We also have the talk and drug analysis. This one is very popular because it's able to help you prevent mechanical sticking, which is essentially a situation or scenario whereby whatever you have in hole can no longer move up or down, in which case, if it is extreme enough, then I actually have, so two things, if it's not that extreme, I have to spend time trying to free the pipe to continue operations. 
But if it's extreme, then it means I have to cut off whatever is in the well, cement that, wasting whatever resources I've put in there to then go ahead and redrill that section. Okay. So have bitware prediction, which is able to monitor the rate at which my the cutters on my bit is getting worn off, right? If it wears completely, it means I can't cut anymore. That means I can't drill anymore, right? So if I can't drill anymore, I can't make a hole. I have to pull out and change the bit. But currently, what happens is you have very low ROP. You're not sure why you have low ROP. So you can get to pull the bit and check if the cutters are worn or not. And then you go back if the cutters are not worn. So I save you the trip. So visualize a scenario whereby I'm currently drilling at 14,000 feet. Okay. And then I'm not sure. I have to pull 14,000 feet. That could very easily take you half a day to pull out to surface and just to check and notice it's good and get back to bottom. That's a day, right, of rig time. Those that know how much a rig costs, uh, rig rental costs, you can do the math. That's, that's a whole lot of time that it saves you, right? Then for well control. So we're able to predict for you the likelihood of you taking a kick or taking losses, all right? So, so far, everywhere that this solution has been deployed, you are able to actually know that you've taken a kick before any systems on the surface is able to detect it. So it does two things. On the one hand, you're able to prepare for a kick, right? Prepare to remove a kick from the, uh, from the well before it actually happens, pretty much. And as well, imagine if it takes me 10 minutes to, oh, that's 10 minutes is, is, is kind of large. So imagine it takes me two minutes to know that I've taken a kick. That's a large amount of kick. If it takes me two seconds to know I've taken a kick, then the amount of kick I have to sort out is really small. Saves you time. Uh, provides actually safety in this case because it's well controlled we're talking uh, and things like this, right? Now for the anti-collision monitoring, this is another sort of safety feature. So it's able to look at offset wells, get my survey in, and then confirm how close I am to other wells. So naturally, I don't want to hit an existing well because that's bad, right? So I'm going to damage the well, lose production, and then all that um, oil that's supposed to be coming from other wells come to the surface, damage things, because it's not expected, right? Create a lot of problems. Uh, deep water horizon incident very quickly comes to mind. So we don't want that anti-collision result that for you. They'll have um, real-time hydraulics. So this essentially ensures that your cuttings are coming efficiently to the surface and do not stay back in the well to then become a problem. Then we have swab and surge. Um, a couple of folks on this call will know that if you are pulling out pipe from the from the hole or you're running in pipe in the hole too fast, especially when there's tight clearance and you run into problems. So pull too fast and they're likely to pull in a kick, which you then have to resolve if it doesn't create serious work control uh, concerns at the surface. Uh, and then if you're going in and you're going in too fast, then you search the well, meaning you can fracture the formation and all your mod goes into the well, uh, goes into the formation, leaving with no hydrostatic protection, and then you have a work control concerns. All right. We also have um, the predictive microservice that lets you know the chances of you getting stuck when you're pulling out of hole because you have pack of stuff is getting into the hole. The well uh, is not as stable as it should be and issues like this. So the ROP optimization is really part of the 3D uh, intelligence that tells you stay within this rate of penetration and things will be safe. Uh, stay away from all the bucklings or the critical speed and issues like this. So also are building a, a solution right now to be incorporated into this uh, real-time model engineering where it will look at your trip rates, both tripping in and tripping out in a lot more detail, right? Including overall condition, what effects of tripping a, set, a certain speed is and how close you are to the efficient zone, the green zone, if you like. All right, what's today's technology? Because I've, I've dwelt a lot on um, the difference between um, how we do things today, which is what I prefer to call traditional, and where we want to be going. So one of the first things I would like to point out is that this technology is a game changer. I know we hear that a lot, and all these buzz and fancy words, but really it is. Because when you digitalize your operations, and you're able to see problems before they occur. That is, that, is, that is massive, okay? Most people that's, that have seen the future, say for instance, when we move from regular calls that we not, couldn't get regular phones that couldn't get connected to the internet. So this is just like going from that system to getting today's uh, 
AI, immersive uh, phones and technologies, right? That's sort of the kind of game changer this is for drilling operations. So currently we do things in, things, in ways that are manual, leave room for a lot of human error. Uh, that means you could very easily get into uh, non-productive time, which is wasted effort. It, it, this is the same place we're putting it. What if you can automate these things, right? What if you can compare what you planned with what you're currently seeing? What if you're able to take away times to run calculations on engineering, but just focus on looking at results and making decisions, right? That is massively efficient. That is where you want to be. That's what you, you want to be doing, right? Saves you time and money. And then ensures you don't, you don't end up having problems that could endanger the crew that are doing operations. So I'm going to talk about just a few of those models in, in detail, just some of the key ones, so we won't spend too much time. So I'm going to take up the first one, which is the um, talk and drag analysis. Um, going to try to explain this plot. I know a lot of folks here are geoscientists, but I'll try. So essentially what I have is when I model before operations start, I can have solid lines. This is where this is what my model says that I'm going to do. Then when real-time data starts coming, I can then start having dots of real-time information plotting, you know, side by side with what I predicted, right? Or what I modeled beforehand. So when there's a deviation, I need to now find out why there's a deviation because usually a deviation is caused by something. And if the thing causing the deviation is negative, I need to resolve that because if it deviates in a wrong direction and it deviates uh, enough, then I'm going to run into actual problems. So this helps you prevent getting stuck in the first place. I've earlier explained what the consequences of that could be in rig time and costs and money. Okay. Then I'm going to also talk about a second microservice, which I, uh, we call anti-collision monitoring. So the anti-collision monitoring is able to take whatever anti-collision model you've run before operations start. So that model would include your offset information, the surveys for those wells, the, the survey tools that were used to take surveys, as well as what the company policy is as regards where you want to start getting warned that you have an issue. Every company has a no-go zone of the separation factor of one. So you don't want any well to be have a separation of a factor of one between it and an offset well. So while it will actually run the analysis and show you the analysis as it's running it, it doesn't actually require any human in interface. All you really need to do is to visualize the message log. So white, no action needs to be taken. Yellow, you need to be careful and start moving away. What you do not want to see is red messages or red, yeah, red flags like this, right? That's what you don't want to see. Now, this is the 3D visualization. So essentially, what this is showing you is the effective window where things are optimized. You can see what is currently blinking here because the blinking dot is your real-time dot. So you want things to see nice and uh, nice and tidy within this window here. Anything outside this window is not optimized. Anything within this window is optimized. So this helps whoever is seeing this. Perhaps it could be somebody sitting in the office looking at this. So you're seeing the operations as closely or even better than the guys at the rig side. And then you can call and advise. That's why we call this a um, real-time well advisory solution while you're drilling. So you're able to look at the envelope and advise those on the rig to see, do this. Because the advice is basically coming from this system, right? So you just call because they have a lot of physical things that they're looking at. You now call them and say, you do this. One of the things I also need to quickly mention is, now the driller has a lot of jobs to do. Okay, so sometimes this, this, these jobs he has to do requires, takes a lot of his attention so he may miss a lot of things. This system will not miss any of the things that you want it to be watching out for. Like I said, it's artificially intelligent. It's been programmed to look out for certain things and to flag things that are not right, and it does that. So right now I'm going to play a three, four minute video. Or, well, I'm almost getting to the end of the presentation. Just a three, four minute video so you see how the, this solution will work sort of like a demonstration how the solution will work while you're using it uh, for a live data hello my name is nazar and i'm a drilling engineer sitting in the virtual remote operations center or vro in my role i rely on good quality real-time data from rts to predict mitigate unwanted events like stockpile loss circulation and kicks 
while recommending drilling parameters to optimize ROP and well bore quality. This is the main screen of my real-time well engineering solution or RTWE. Using the exception-based alerts, I can monitor many wells while still focusing on the ones that require support and advice. In RTWE, I have a number of models that use both physics and machine learning algorithms. Here are just a few of them. Talk and drag that calculates your friction factors automatically using the real-time data. Early kick prediction, which gives me an overall risk index of getting a kick. Double bit grading to help understand bit condition and help reduce ILT. Hydraulics model for real-time hydraulics calculations. And this includes a risk index for hole cleaning. Swab and surge for optimum tripping speeds. Anti-collision with real-time distance calculations and alerts. All these models are available in our cloud-based RTWE solution, as well as at the rig site. That sound in the background is an alarm coming out from one of my wells. From my exception-based screen, I can see two alarms, hydraulics and token drag. I will now investigate these alarms further using my wildcard view. This is my wildcard view, very similar to the driller's view on the rig. I can see my alerts, including open drag and hydraulics. I can look at my drilling stability map to show my recommended drilling parameters. I can also add additional layers, for instance, lithology. And I can use this view as a high level view of the well, showing any events that occur on my current well. I will now drill down further into my torque and drag and hydraulics alerts to confirm and validate these alerts. In my torque and drag view, I can see my changes to pick up and slack off weights, changes to break over torque, and a significant increase in friction factor calculated automatically by the system. I will now go to my hydraulics view. In my hydraulics view, I can see a critical alert for cuttings concentration indicating a possible hole cleaning issue. Based on my findings and collaborating with the driller, we have agreed that this is hole cleaning related and decided to pull off bottom and pump with sweep. As part of my acknowledgement process, I also have access to standard operating procedures or SOPs that I can use as a reference or can be shared with other users on the system. The reason for the whole cleaning issue does not appear to be related to geometry, at least based on the current path. However, we did see some changes in ontology based on LWD data via our visualization to DSR T365. Your scientist is immediately informed by our chat to review the geological information and adjust the plan if necessary. If a new plan is approved, our TWE or real-time well engineering will calculate the projected surveys and also provide details of the recommended weight emit, RPM, and flow rate for drilling to the new target. Okay, that's the end of the video. So um, come to my last slide. So most of the time when you present new technology, most people like to see, all right, where have you tested this before? Tested this, this, this solution has been deployed uh, globally in North America for Oxy and other places actually. I just captured for other regions outside Nigeria. I just captured one company per region. So in North America, there's Oxy. In Latin America, there's Ecopetrol. In uh, Asia Pacific, there's Impex. Uh, back home here, we've deployed this solution for um, Oriental Energy. Uh, Total Energy has also utilized this solution both for their JV uh, and for their deep water. And then Watersmith has also deployed this solution. Some of the benefits that they have um, seen from using this solution, I, and again, this is their own uh, feedback, right? This is their own testimonial pretty much. So we have um, companies that, you know, when we first su we suggest the system, they go, no, let's use the traditional one. We, we, we can use that, that's fine. And then we'll try to propose a solution. They had issues, but 
at the end of the day, they had to rely on its use for subsequent wells. Um, for another uh, multi-well deployment of this solution, the, by the time we had refined how this was the, the, uh, deployed for them to suit their system the best, their last well that they did, they deployed this for, is the fastest that they've drilled in a field of a lot of wells, right? A lot of wells, considerable number of wells. Now, one other operator was having issues on a well. And then we say, what issues are you having? They said, okay, yeah, we have a lot of uh, hole related concerns. We actually want to cement where we are and then do a sidetrack. We said, no, if it's hole related solutions, this solution is able to see the fact that you're about to have a challenge before the challenge occurs, and then we'll advise you accordingly. And they went ahead and drilled to TD without any issues. So I guess you can say we we'll saved them a side track. We have done it just much. So the idea is reduce MPT considerably by predicting problems before they occur and then deploy mitigation um, ac actions or measures so that those problems do not come to pass. So with that, I would summarize like this. So this is a solution that is open, meaning our solution can connect to and work with um, solutions from other uh, service product providers. Um, this takes away the time for running calculations and running engineering and, and modeling. And you can just focus on looking at results and making decisions. We'll have uncertainty embedded just so that you know what you're working with that reduces unknowns, right? So you, you can measure and quantify your uncertainty, enhancing your accuracy. Thank you for giving me this time. And I will take questions if there are any. Thanks once again. Cheers. Thank you, Chukwemeka, for a very interesting um, presentation. Um, we are going to, I would like to advise uh, people who have uh, questions to submit uh, through the Q&A. Um, I see two questions have already come in. We'll take those questions in a bit. Uh, before we do that, I wanted to just quickly run through uh, the summary that I was able to pick from this presentation. Um, the, the, and this is gonna be uh, pretty brief. The, the first thing is that um, it appears this method um, allows access to data across disciplines. So the different disciplines that are involved in the uh, drilling operations. Um, it also allows for connectivity of the different data forms. Um, allows for visualization of data as well as models, different models. And um, it lets you collect and analyze data in real time. Um, gives the ability to update models and uh, make predictions um, while you are drilling. And subsequently, it saves time. And of course, like we know, saving time in drilling operations is saving money. So it saves time and money. And um, it also enhances safety uh, during drilling operations. Uh, that's uh, my own list of summaries. Um, so I will uh, go ahead and read out the questions we have. Currently, we have two. Um, if there are other questions, please go ahead and, and send them in. And then we'll see how many we can take uh, before we end this session. So Sorry. the first question... Let me interrupt you with Mr. Bashu. Your video is okay. not on. I don't know if you are aware. Oh, my video? Yeah, now it's on. Great. Okay. Okay. okay, I hope you heard all I said, though. Yes, yes, we heard. Yes, we heard. Okay, thank you. So, um, like I was saying, there are two questions uh, already, so I'm going to start with the first one. Um, and um, while we're waiting for other questions, I have my own questions that I'll ask in between. So, the first question is uh, from uh, Dr. Lawrence Fadia, um, OAU. And it goes thus, I have always known that the drilling process involves the integration of several subdisciplines to minimize uncertainties and avoid drilling problems. Can the presenter share his experience of such integration, especially incorporating real-time biostrat data in geosteering? So, Chupemeka. All right, thanks for, for the very insightful question, right? It's, it's absolutely brilliant. So. 
The problem with collaboration between disciplines is usually that of human error, <clears throat> ego, and time with back and forth. So one of the things that this addresses is reduce the human interaction and hence error and whatever else that's associated with it and cut off time. So data or numbers, as they say, do not lie, right? So just full integration. So I don't need to export imports. We are looking at the wrong one. That's not the objective. No, it's the same model that we're looking at. So whatever you've done, it will pull this information through. So let me um, mention a hypothetical uh, not hypothetical, an example scenario. If I say hypothetical, it look like it's not real, but it is real, right? I don't want to mention any specific company, but it goes stars. So, uh, and I want to separate the design from operations, but I'm going to talk design briefly and then talk operations. So say for design, whenever you update your static model, you might sometimes update what your targets are and hence update your trajectory. So if you're using what we we'll call the digital world program. As soon as you make this change, it's able to pull that trajectory and rerun all the engineering applications, that, so all the engineering uh, calculations you would love to do, like more framed up uh, trajectory calculations, casing design, uh, operations modeling, and all of that, accounting for temperature and all of that, right? It's going to rerun that and still provide a basis of engineering design, right? That's for design. So let's come operations. So during operations, you are sending logs on the rig, right? And this is going to a unified center. So long as it's a WITSML um, data format, it's able to now take that information, put it into the, the what well, our solution will be the decision space geosciences, right? The horizontal world correlation module. Now, uh, for other people, it might be something different. It will use open wire. Whenever the logs come in, it will take those... Uh, it will take those um, logs, right, and update your structural and, uh, and uh, your structural and static models, right, and update them real time. At the same time, surveys are coming in, right, from the MWD now, not from the LWD. So it's also updating where the well currently is. And then, then give me an instantaneous example. So I get this log and I get the survey, and mm -mm, this direction is not going to do us any good. So you know what? This is what your last survey is reading. Do you want to start changing your direction um, to 275 degrees azimuth based on the reference you already fed into your survey? And the driller will on the rig, you, need, you can only do this using what we call RSS, that's rotary cerebral systems. So on the surface, you put a program in and the two changes to the direction you want it to change, you apply and drill further. Uh, I hope that that breakdown has been helpful. So in this way, everybody's interacting together. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Chief Maker. Um, the next question that I have here is from Professor Maruf Din Adabanija. And it goes thus, uh, this application looks good. Is it global or specific? Because all what you have said about it will depend on geology and drilling history of the area. Okay, that's a good question. That's a good question. So I'm going to try to tackle it in as many um, perspectives as I see it. So from the one perspective, it's global, meaning it's deployed everywhere, right? And it works on the same basic tenet. So there is running calculations, general calculations based on predictions, right? And uh, offset information. There's also the fact that many times what you predicted will not be exactly what you're going to see. So the effectiveness will depend on the kind of problems you have agreed. But most of the time, for the kind of things the system is designed to recognize and capture, it is effective everywhere. Thank you. Thank you. Um, while, while we wait for any uh, potential additional questions, I have two that I would like to ask. Um, the, the first is, um, I don't know, maybe it's more philosophical. And okay. it's that um, there was in your presentation, there's a lot, there was a lot of mention of digitalizing and digitalizing. And my question is, haven't we been digital for a while? So what, what's, Different. what's um, in this case, what is the, how is being digital here different from the digital that we have been, um, you know, for a while? Okay, that's us philosophical and deep, as, as they say. So 
there's what we call there are buzzwords i think that's the best way to start with it right there are buzzwords are you have we truly been digital so somebody will have an i'll use a car for an instance so you have a car you have an improved brake system in order to sell the car quicker better you say you have a digitalized brake system but then again you now find a 2022 mercedes where on the dashboard you press a button and the car breaks that's digitalization. Then if you want to now apply on top of the basic digitalization level, you now want to take it to the IA level, then we'll have cars that you sit in and you say drive, the car drives. I want to go to this location. It goes to Google Map, right, or GPS, and then takes you to where you want to go to. That's true digitalization. That's also internet of things, right? That's where we want to go. So you uh, anything that removes manual having to do calculation, human in, uh, intervention, to the bare minimum, the human being will always be there at some point, at least to make analysis, if nothing else. But to do calculations, try to perform, you know, cut the, out the human as much as possible, automate the system as much as possible, cut down the errors. And of course, refine the system. That's why it's artificial intelligence. So the more data it gets, the more information it has, the better to calibrate the way it does its calculations and the better results you get. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, so it just sounds uh, to me like uh, this has more to do with um, connectivity of the digital data that you collect, as well as the uh, using AI and ML to do, you know, um, pred predictions or analysis. Okay, Absolutely. thank you. Um, there's one more question that has come in. So I'll ask that question before I ask my second question, which will be my last question. Uh, this is from... Dan Juma Jacob Damina, um, he says, great presentation, sir. What would you say is the error margin of the real-time data acquired compared to already modeled data, especially in the geoscience space? Error <laughs> margin of the real-time data. <laughs> Very good question. Uh, and I laugh because there's a lot of context in the question, but let's, let's try it first, right? What is error? And then what is then the margin of error? So if I have a, an interval that is 10 feet, but is laterally extended, right? It becomes really important where that well intersects and, keep, and where, how you keep it in the reservoir, doesn't it? That makes a lot of difference between I'm going to produce 10,000 barrels a day and I'm going to produce 50,000 barrels a day. There's also the question of, Of because it's a, a, a question in sweep efficiency, why want to um, place the well specifically in a particular place in a horizontal reservoir? So, on the one hand, you don't want to, in trying to place the reservoir, is not going to be a perfectly 90 degree, doesn't happen. It's going to have some undulations and things like this, right? So, there's that. I want to keep it within the reservoir, towards the roof of the reservoir. Then you also have when I want to make considerations for gas cloning, water cloning, and I want to produce oil. So, I want to place the well in such a way that. It's not when I produce for one, one month, water starts coming into the production, preferably to the oil. So you want to keep the well in a specific place where you maximize the sweep of the particular hydrocarbon you want, which in this case, I'm assuming it's going to be oil. All right. Now, when we come to error margins, it can be significant depending on how well the first interpretation was done. All right. And then no matter how well it was done, it was done with an offset well of offset information, things change and you don't know by how much, all right? So it could be considerable. The final comments I want to say is, so the world you did the correlation with how long ago was it drilled? The technology that it was drilled with is the, techno is, is the quality of interpretation you would ultimately get. I'm assuming that person is basically generally good. Now the tools for acquisition of this data progressively improve with time. If you take an LWD today and compare it to an LWD that was made in the 90s, yeah, there's a significant, uh, um, what's the word for it now? Significant improvements in quality in terms of data collection and accuracy of the data collected. Uh, I hope that answers the question. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, there are a couple of uh, questions more and we will We'll stop after the next two questions with my, with my last question, because we have just about seven minutes left. Uh, the next question is from Collins Mbako, and his is short. How does this digitization 
operations costs. I think he wants to have an idea of um, maybe the How additional much? cost to, to your regular years. Actually, I'll take it out. out. It's, it's a lot smaller, and there's a reason for that. So most of these digital costs now come, um, how, how will I put it now? Come as, uh, you know, the way you pay as you go. So come as a pay as you go package rather than uh, pay for this installation, pay for that license, pay for this and for that and all of that. No, it doesn't work that way anymore. You pay for what you use, you pay as you go, right? Uh, I'm hoping you can still hear me. Yes, right. we can. All right. So, so that's, that's the one hand, right? So it's pretty small comparatively. But the next thing you want to look at, it's not just raw price. I mean, it's much smaller. I, I, I've answered that. But the next thing you want to look at is um, a typical example where I take a kick. I've used getting stock. So let's go to take a kick. So I take a kick. And what will typically happen? So assuming it doesn't become a serious issue that will chase people away from the rig, right? So that's a minimum. In order to remove a kick from the from the well, you use slow circulating rate. So you remove that kick slowly, so that because it's a human being that's going to man, uh, handle the choke at the surface and let out things and let out the kick uh, gently. That takes time, and time during operations is rig time. So why I talk about this is if I look at the problem that this is solving and I compare it on one well, on two incidents on one well. The amount of money it saves you just from two incidents on one well is more than the amount that the, the, this technology costs. So I want you to put, yeah, one is cheap, but on the, on the other hand, also put costs in perspective of value. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So uh, this is the last uh, posted question uh, from an anonymous attendee. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the presentation is timely. I just want to ask if the real-time well engineering solutions is different from the landmark software by Halliburton. How does it help in bit selection optimization? Okay, so um, one, it is, this is a landmark solution. So that part is good. It's not the same regular suite of software. Those ones are not real-time. Those ones are well engineering, modeling, design, right? The, that's what those do, but this is real time. So this is those same calculations on the fly. But regarding bit optimization, I would say it doesn't. What it simply tracks is bit performance, or if you like, bit wear prediction to be more specific, that's what it does. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So um, my last question, uh, my second and last question uh, to end this is, um, I know that um, this, what you described uses um, cloud data. Absolutely. Um, there is also a similar system that uses edge computing Good. instead of cloud data. So what's what's the how does it compare? How do they compare? What's the main difference? All right. So the main difference is location. And yes, by the way, the data from the edge can and very often does go to the cloud, especially because edge is designed for full automation. So when I say it's full automation, I mean I can practically sit in the office now and make a decision that the rig would do on the rig while I'm here. Uh, I'm, many people here will probably know, uh, or for the few that don't know, typically the directional driller and the MWD folk will need to be on the rig to guide the two, right? But if you digitalize that process, you can actually get that control, what the guide of the rig does. You can get that control to your your computer in the office. And then what they essentially do is, well, it's going in the wrong direction, you input what we call a downlink. So downlink is like you send a signal to the tool and you say, do such and such, I need you to go in this direction. And the tool will downhold, arrange itself in such a way that it will now start moving in that direction. So you can get that here. So that sort of thing is done using a, a, an edge appliance, as we, as we like to call it, right? So edge appliance helps automation because you can hook the edge ap appliance to the, uh, not, uh, not sensors, to the particle systems on the rig. So the edge appliance will have access to the pumps, will have access to the rig itself, the top by itself, right? And then you can send through the edge appliance and tell driller, please take to this thing, or feed this particular set of signal to the rig and it will do this. That's the edge appliance. Unfortunately, most rigs, not every rig, they have, there are probably some um, modern rigs in country, but most rigs in country are not optimized yet. 
right for full edge appliance utilization they can be used but to a smaller extent if you if you want to see what the edge can do it's pretty amazing if you have a, a modern rig a fully auto autonomous rig as they like to call them yes thank you sir okay um thank you very much you can make i mean this has been engaging uh you have not talked to engineers but um obviously this is an area where we uh, work together and uh, i'm sure that um, as it has been for me, I'm sure that the listeners have also enjoyed this session. So thanks once again. Uh, Tubo, so it's, the floor is yours now. Indeed. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Bashir and also Chukwe Mika. It's been an amazing presentation, so to speak. There are a couple of questions around whether your slides are available. I recognize that this is confidential or it will, it definitely does contain a couple of confidential information there or maybe proprietary information. So we'd like, if you're interested, please rewatch this on our YouTube channel uh, because the company will not be releasing this document to you. Uh, on a personal level. So please, if you want to catch up with this video again, it's on our Facebook, it's on YouTube, and you can, you can pick up the learnings anytime you want it. So it's on that note that I would like to call the um, representative from Ali Botin who will take the sponsor's remark and the person of Mr. Gideon, if I'm correct, uh, to take the sponsor's remark before I then bring the P up. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Loud and clear. Okay. I'm happy to be in your midst once again as a NAPE member, but I will rewrote this to Temi Tokwe Adele, who is the technical manager for Halibut, to do that. Tokwe, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Right. Can you hear me? Yes, please. We hear you. Hey, uh, good afternoon. My name is uh, Tokpe Adeli. I'm the country technical manager for Halliburton. And I'd like to thank uh, Mr. President and uh, the executive committee and every member of PANAPI for taking time out of a very busy schedule uh, to be part of this uh, session where we presented the real time uh, well engineering. And I want to believe that uh, the information shared so far is worth the time. And also employ you to yeah, get back to us if you have uh, more questions. We can always talk more on this because uh, we've actually deployed this service in country with very positive feedback as um, makers have communicated. So for Halliburton, uh, digitalization is one of our strategic priorities as a company. And our uh, RTW actually falls under the work construction package of which uh, has been properly um, analyzed by the maker. So, and we have come to see the benefits of the RTW abilities and uh, to deliver consistent value to our customers and uh, at the lowest uh, cost per barrel because it takes out a lot of human errors and also serves as, a, as an extra eye over your drilling and uh, well activities. So also uh, the use of uh, digital technologies uh, focus areas uh, of collaborative well engineering, uh, remote operations and also integrated automation, which we've discussed have uh, begun to transform uh, planning operations into a more streamlined and evergreen process, uh, which we've uh, used during the pandemic, where multiple personnel from around the world were able to log into a single uh, platform and were able to uh, reduce uh, MPT while also uh, minimizing our uh, carbon footprints. So uh, lastly, for me, uh, I got the comment of the president and that is well noted that Halliburton, or not Halliburton, that uh, you need more participation uh, from companies. So I'll be taking this back to my organization from the vice president. And uh, I'll assure you that you get to see more participation uh, from Halliburton in Africa going forward. So thank you very much uh, for the privilege to prevent, uh, present and uh, do have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Timmy Tokwe. I would like to call on Elliot now, our president-elect, to close the technical session of our business meeting. Over to you, P. Uh, thank you, Tuba. Uh, yes, thanks uh, a lot uh, for, for this. I want to first uh, thank um, the presenter, Rebecca Chideke, for this uh, most enlightening um, 
presentation, and I think uh, even though he said he was he's not uh, at the beginning, he said he was not a geoscientist. But I think going through the presentation, we all we all we all um, saw that we all see what he was seeing from his eyes, and it was a testament to how well he was able to, to show this. And um, really, really grateful for for his um, presentation. Uh, also to our chairperson, um, uh, Bashir Koyedoye, uh, F. Nape, for steering the affairs of this um, uh, presentation today, um, and for the, the questions and the clarity which we were able to um, also um, shed light to what um, what Emeka was uh, presenting. Uh, for those who, who attended the session, uh, first I want to thank the sponsor. Uh, I, I said this to um, America yesterday that um, it's, not, it's, not, it's not often you find um, uh, uh, companies that volunteer their, their, their presentations like this, like America has done. We did not very seek for this, and the body sort us out. Uh, this is the good. This is the way it should be. Uh, I think we have a good product. We have a good um, uh, product and uh, to sell. But more importantly, they see a good vehicle to to uh, showcase what they are doing and really grateful for for their help and uh, for the vice president for helping to um for to things all through uh the members of the advisory council are on the are on the call um good afternoon and uh, thank you for attending members of the executive committee uh, fellows uh, members of NAPE and um like the president also said, um, associate members and interested members of the public who have also joined today's meeting just uh, to appreciate their time. And also to the staff of the association uh, who uh, continue to work behind the scenes but ensure that uh, these um, 10 committees go on uh, without a hitch. I just uh, want to thank them all and um, look forward to. Um, uh, yeah, we're planning to have a physical, a physical technical meeting, um, if, uh, hopefully uh, for the June session. So uh, details of that will be advertised uh, via the various uh, social uh, media platforms to to interested members of uh, NAPI and the public. Well, thank you, um, uh, for, uh, PS, for, uh, for what you do and uh, for a successful uh, technical session for this uh, month. Great, thank you very much. Uh, so let's just run quickly through the announcement so that everyone is caught up to date as to what is happening in the what will be happening in the coming weeks. Uh, so the president has spoken elaborately about the elections. These are the advertised positions. So please, we're looking for committed and available members. And thank you, Ali Bolton, for even spearheading our discourse with organizational leadership. Thank you so much for that. But this really is to enforce that our um, extended date is now 23rd of May, 2022. So that's Monday, three working days time. So please, there are a couple of requirements that you need to, um, to you, need, you need to be able to submit your form and of course, even pass the nominations. So please ensure that you read through all the guidelines, the, the constitution, to do that. Membership deals, we can't overemphasize this. So if you are not getting nappy mails, it's because your membership deals is not up to date. And if you are getting nappy mails, it's maybe that you're just lucky because there are sometimes we try to be nice and send activities that we know are free, like this technical session to everyone, whether you are up to date or not, but you are missing a lot if you are not up to date. So the, the deals are as, um, here, it's really 12,000 naira for active members and our student members pay 2000. Um, you all know that NAPE is a not-for-profit organization. So this, this is really where the vehicle and the money that moves their association forward comes from. So please pay up your membership dues. I talked about this earlier. The Joe Science Education Series is a public social, quote and unquote, advocacy series to take geoscience science and upstream activities to the public via social platforms. And the next one is going to be happening via Twitter space. We have four surprises for you, like we did with the first 
uh, session. Um, the review for our speakers will come up, but we invite you to go to NAPE special social pages and guess who these people are. We left clues for you to decipher who these individuals are. They are all NAPE members, by the way, and you should be able to know them if you are familiar with uh, NAPE activities. Again, another call to volunteer when you are approached. And the title for this is Transferable Skills for Geoscientists and the Energy Transition. So this is not to say that we are moving geoscientists out of the energy industry. It is how can you really, the skill sets that you have had over the years, how can you begin to transfer this and prefer solutions as we go into the era of energy mix um, in the industry. And this will happen on Tuesday, 24th of May. This event will be after work hours, 4.30 p.m. West Africa time. So please join us. All details are going to be sent via mail and also via social pages. The worry session, the worry chapter, pardon me, would also be having a technical presentation titled an integrated approach to flow assurance techniques for hydrocarbon production uh, on Thursday, 26th of May by 11 a.m. The links are out. Please register. It starts by 11 a.m. Please join in. The book donation drive, we've been sending this out. So this initiative is to support our universities, even though they are on strike, but it's to support our students to have access to books. And I, I know that this may sound a bit off the track, but please do not send us old books. <laughs> do not send us books that can't be used. You know, send books that you know that the students can use that are still in good condition. You can send it to the secretariat or you can reach out to Jumoke Akinkwalu or ABS um, to arrange pickup if you, if you really require that. The secretariat is located in Lagos, uh, somewhere on the island. So yeah, the, the address is actually even off. It, it's a drop-off location. Uh, I would like to encourage members to please join this initiative. This is a big deal. I mean, you all know that Nigerian university graduates really would benefit from good resources, technical resources. So please join in and donate your books. The NAPE short course, unfortunately, had to be postponed. It was supposed to happen 5th and 6th of May, but due to circumstances beyond our control, it was postponed to 2nd and 3rd of June. So that implies that there's still opportunity for you to register. This has been shared via our email correspondences, but we are asking that you, 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 you get on this train. Members get 75% discounts. Think about that. And, and this, is, this is a timely topic, Essentials of Oilfield Geomechanics, going to be taken by Dr. Jerome. So we ask that you please make registrations, make payments. You can do it. You can even get, um, you, you, you can go the approach of doing bulk payments, maybe from an organization or maybe group of friends and approach Victoria or Chris to have discussions around how you can benefit from this, this course. For this one, I'm going to call Ifai Ekwese, the current YP lead, to talk us through what this idea is about, the entrepreneurship program, and the technical workshop they have in the coming days. Ifai, please, over to you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Please, can you confirm you can hear me? We can hear you. Okay. Oh, uh, we can't see you. Is it possible we see you? <laughs> Where I am is not there. Okay, let me go to. No, it's okay. It. It's okay. If I go ahead. Okay. Um, for the entrepreneurship program, the the idea is, you know, some of the falls in the in the, in the YP side. Uh, really, you know, they have nothing doing, or those that have some business ideas but they're having issues with funding, or those that are currently doing business. But but requires uh, some 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 form of support. So that is actually a pilot program. So that is what really encouraged us to push out this program. And fortunately for us, we got uh, wonderful support from from DigiConnect, and uh, they will be sponsoring the program. Uh, about over 100 people actually applied to this program. <laughs> Last week Saturday was the deadline. So we are currently sorting out uh, the applications after which we forward um, those that their business uh, 
the business idea or business uh, proposals are, are relevant to to area of interest to the judges and also will have uh, they will have opportunity those selected will have opportunity to pitch their business and the judges will make the final selections and that will happen on the on last saturday of the month on 28 of course we look at the fly we see that we have a, a seasoned geoscientists scientists and business owners and uh, so they're in a better position to actually help not just uh, to look at their business ideas and at the same time provide mentorship also help them to to come out to speed in whichever areas of uh, business of interest that, that they have and we also believe that uh, going forward this can also be consolidated upon you know maybe the uh, the parent body can also look in this direction as well and see if uh, it could it could be a, a yearly program and and also expanded to also incorporate more people and also um, some other areas as well uh, for the uh, not technical uh, for the YP workshop, uh, we we already, we, already, uh, we had one in Abuja and Uyo. So this one for for our car would have happened uh, last Saturday, but due to circumstances beyond our control, we have to ship the program to next month, 11th of uh, June. And uh, by the grace of God, uh, we look forward to 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 having that in the Southeast region. Um, that is it, uh, basically. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ifrain. So members, please, you are encouraged to join, encouraged to encourage your young geoscientists in the office to join this technical sessions or workshop that the YPs have been planning have been phenomenal, and they are doing it across the region. So please join uh, and encourage others to join. And you can actually also sponsor students to join. Uh, the, the prize is free. 5,000 Naira is free somewhat. So uh, if you would like to sponsor students, sponsor young professionals in your organization, please speak to anyone at the secretariat and they will be able to help you. So um, Cynthia isn't here, but the business evaluation competition is planned to be announced very soon. This is one of our flagship events for young professionals and students at the NAPI conference. It is modeled after the Imperial Barrel Awards uh, competition, but this time domiciled to Nigeria exploration activities. Universities are being asked to enroll. If you would like to participate, um, the link to participate is here. There are also re requirements that each university must adhere to before they are um, accepted into the program. So your faculty advisor needs to be involved. Your head of HOD, head of department needs to be involved. So please, if you have more questions, feel free to send any email to the secretariat. They will direct you to Cynthia or Cynthia to you. She's the one, she's the committee lead for this activity and she'll be happy to help you. We also have the volunteer call for mentor mentorship. If you would like to mentor, if you would like to be a part of this, to teach students, either to coach them or to be um, to act as technical coaches or mentors, uh, this is for you. They're looking for people that are uh, more matured in the industry. So please participate, sign up to be a mentor to any of the schools. And I can assure you that this is one of like, the biggest experience that people really do have mentorship, giving back to. To the, to the people behind us, <laughs> to younger people. <laughs> right, the NAPI Awards is also here. Nominations has been open for a while. It will close by June 30th. These are the list of our awards. Aretha Adams, Beno Sumo, without reading all of it. Please, if you think you deserve this award, I know sometimes we, culturally, we are not used to hearing that, but if you think that you deserve this award, Please submit your nomination. If you think that your colleague deserves this award, please nominate them. You know, these awards are really for you. Uh, it's for NAPE to showcase you and your contributions to the industry and to yourself. So please, I'm imploring, if you feel that you need, you, 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 these awards are deserving of you, please do not shy up. Please nominate yourself. So what I've just done is to run you through all the activities we have for May, as you have seen here. And I hope that you please continue to join us 
follow us on all the social medias, catch up on these videos, our technical meetings on YouTube and all the other channels. And that's the end of our announcements for today. I hope this has been a great session for you. I would like to call first the president-elect to close this session with his vote of thanks. And if the president is still on the call, I'd like him to close the session formally, and then we can uh, close, close up. So PE first for vote of thanks, and then president to formally close the session. Uh, P.S. I think the president will just uh, close the session. Yes. Okay, I, I don't I see him. All right. Yes. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Toilet. yeah. Right. Uh, Tumoso, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. Uh, you know, as I said earlier, I might not have been here till the end of this program, but uh, to tell you the truth, uh, the presentation was so uh, interesting and exciting that I couldn't leave. I just had to sit through it. Thank you very much, uh, Halliburton. And thank you very much, Chukwe Mecca, for giving us uh, a very uh, interesting and insightful rendition of uh, what's happening in digital uh, drilling. Um, Thank you very much uh, to all the members of NAPE who have been on this call. And I'm sure that uh, you've been able to uh, take home uh, some interesting uh, uh, knowledge uh, because uh, everything you learn um, as you get older, some things you never knew and uh, we can only improve. And we are happy to have Halliburton give us this uh, very exciting talk. Um, all the announcements have come in and we are going to continue to um, uh, drum on all members to continue to uh, uh, support the association. Um, thank you very much to the uh, team, uh, to the PE, uh, working tirelessly to bring us these um, interesting uh, technical meetings. Um, beyond that, also the chapters uh, and all that they are doing. Uh, thank you very much uh, to the um, uh, backroom staff uh, in Indefatigable in uh, Tunde and his team. Uh, thank you very much uh, to the PS. Um, very uh, excellent uh, way of uh, taking this whole session to a crescendo. And uh, uh, not the least, let me say a very big thank you to Bashir. I haven't seen Bashir in uh, almost, uh, um, I last saw Bashir uh, post, uh, no, pre-COVID, you know, so it's very good to, to see him uh, come in and be uh, an able chairman on this uh, occasion. So thank you very much to all the emeritus uh, and other fellows of NAPE who have been on this call. And um, many thanks for the board of trustee uh, members and the advisory council members who have been on this call. And um, without uh, wasting too much time, uh, actually I'm supposed to be traveling back to Abuja today. So um, that means I understand this uh, session to be very important. That's why I had to reschedule my flight to make sure that I sit through all of this and um, I'm happy I did because I'm a lot wiser now and I can recommend a few things to some people. Thank you very much, all NAPE members for coming. And we hope to see you again soon at the next technical meeting. Thank you very much. Tumosum, over to you. 
Thank you very much, Dr. James. Always a pleasure um, to, to have you have this session and every member of NAPE always on this call. So that's the end of our presentation and our business meeting for the month of May. We are giving back to you 13 minutes of your time uh, just so that you can do something with it. And, you know, to assure you that we wouldn't, we wouldn't waste your time. Our 11 to 1 is 11 to 1, and we try to keep it at that. So that's the end of the session. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Cheers. Thank you very much. Okay. So now you can stop recording. Uh, Tomaso. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, let me call you. Don't don't get off. Don't get off. Fine. Okay.